This is ThinkTech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and this is Cannabis Chronicles. It is a 10,000-year odyssey. So tell me, muse, of that great plant of many resources which wandered far and wide the ancient plant of food, fuel, and fiber, and cultivated for millennia. As we venture through the past 10,000 years, we will explore and discover the plant from which cannabis derives, the many uses of the plant, hemp, hashes, cannabis, cannabis and religion, cannabis and medicine, cannabis and dear old Uncle Sam, and so our odyssey begins. Today, our odyssey is not long ago and far away. It is current and it is in progress. And that is medical cannabis. My guest today is my dear, dear friend, Scott Foster. And Scott has been a medical cannabis advocate since the very beginning. So, Scott, welcome back. Aloha, Marsha. So, we're talking about medical cannabis. So, let's start with Scott. And how did you get involved? Because you've been involved since, what is it, 02? 20, well, 20, 02, something like that. Really so, how did you get involved? That, yes. Yeah. Uh, I was, uh, uh, came from the uh, 60s and uh, uh, Cannabis in those days was a considered a recreational uh, drug, although many people who used it, including myself, uh, uh, understood that it had a therapeutic effect, that it had a calming, calming effect, that it uh, certainly uh, had a relaxing effect. And uh, uh, so as the years passed, I sort of quit using it, it fell out of favor, and, and uh, until 1998, when my late wife, Lynn Ellen, uh, Lynn Ellen, Ellen Ryan, uh, was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And uh, uh, someone suggested that uh, marijuana might help her with her nausea. And uh, I, I don't, hadn't smoked marijuana in years, and, so I got, got some from a friend, and sure enough, during her final days, uh, it reduced her nausea, but it also had a dramatic impact on her mental state. Uh, the heavy drugs that were, were prescribed uh, took care of her physical pain, but the medical marijuana uh, took away her anxiety. And so until her final day, uh, marijuana was part of her regime. So what, so you did both the heavy, the mar morphine as well as the, the marijuana? Yes, uh, uh, well actually uh, morphine was the first stage. Uh, Dilaudid, which is an IV drug, mm -hmm. uh, was the, the drug that, w that really worked for the pain at the acute stage. And uh, Liquid Ativan was a a relaxer, a, mm -hmm. a, 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 a to help take care of the anxiety. But uh, those two drugs usually just put her to sleep. With the marijuana, I found that I could back off because I was her caregiver at home. Mm -hmm. I could back off on the heavy IV drugs, and uh, uh, the uh, marijuana took care of her anxiety. And the emotional. And the emotional. So she was able to it. communicate. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. And watch basketball, which was her favorite <laughs> game, and, and really until three days before her death, uh, uh, she had a a a good death. Mm -hmm. A good death. I like mm -hmm. that phrase. So tell me real quick. Um, so that's how why you got started in this move to make um, to move from recreational, something you had to buy on the corners, to medical 
That was, Lenny's death was uh, uh, January of 1998. Mm -hmm. And uh, coincidentally, uh, that was the same time that the Hawaii drug, the drug policy forum of Hawaii was being created. Uh, I got a phone call uh, from Dr. Donald Topping, uh, who was working with Pam Lichty. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Don has passed a number of years ago. Pam is still quite active in, in the medical marijuana movement uh, with the Drug Policy Forum of Hawaii. And uh, so I joined with them to help get that organization started. And then out of nowhere, Don Topping called me and said, what do you think about trying to pass a medical marijuana bill? And uh, I said, sure, why not? And so off we went and two years later, we had passed the first medical marijuana legislation in the nation that came through a legislature. Uh, there were one or two other states that had passed it through referendum. Mm Hawaii -hmm. doesn't have referendum. So there we had the drug. There we had the, there the, we the, had the, the bill. The bill. And that was 02. Uh, that was 2000. 20, I meant 20. Yeah, that was the year 2000. Mm -hmm. 2000. And so we're. So here we are with a pretty good established medical cannabis. Our state is the only one that has changed the word from marijuana to cannabis because marijuana is derogatory. And so we're very happy with where the state is. We still have a long way to go, but we're getting there. So I want to thank you personally for all you've done to get us to this point and for your willingness to share your experience with your wife. I hate to tell you this, but I remember all of that time. <laughs> but he did do a magnificent job with his wife. I, it's one of those things you think, I hope my husband can do that. <laughs> <laughs> but again, Scott, as always, thank you so much for taking the time to share that with us. And stay on board, because we've got a long way to go. I'll be there. Thank okay. you, Marsha. Aloha. We're going to take a break, and we'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Some say scuba divers are the poor man's astronaut. At Dive Heart, we believe that to be true. We say forget the moon. Dive Heart can help children, adults, and veterans of all abilities escape gravity right here on Earth. Search DiveHeart.org and imagine the possibilities in your life. They said I could play, so any chance to play at all. You know, that's my life. I love music. Yeah, that's how we do it. Aloha. My name is Mark Schlav. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea comes on every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join us. I like to bring in guests that talk about all types of things that come across the sea to Hawaii. Not just law, love, people, ideas, history. Please join us for Law Across the Sea. Aloha. And we're back. Hi. Hi. How you doing, Marcia? Great. This is Carmi. Hi, everybody. And Carmi is from Hawaiian oh. Hod Hod Hydroponics, Hydroponics and, and Gardens. gardens. Yeah. Yes. I met Carmi at the expo right. um, here, right. the Cannabis Expo. Yep. That was our first time meeting. And then, expo. yes, it was great. That was a great expo. But I love the idea that Carmi has hydroponics and aquaponics. So I went to visit the store her, mm -hmm. and looked around at all of the things 
there. So what I would like for A to tell us all about hydroponics and aquaponics and about because this is Cannabis Chronicles. Right. And there's so many new people that say, well, I've got this card and it says I can grow plants. Mm -hmm. But now what? I don't know how to grow anything. Right. What, where do I start? How do I start? Right. And so when I discovered you, I thought this is the person to ask. It definitely what, would be. <laughs> what, where do we go from here? Okay, now I've got the card. Now what? So um, let me just uh, clarify real quick, though. So we are a full-service garden center. Yes. And so we do soil, hydro. Uh, we do cater to people doing aquaponics as well and indoor-outdoor gardening. And Wonderful. So, yes. I've, uh, my, my dad ended up starting the business back in 93, um, and I ended up buying from him when I was 24 in 2006 and just really taking off with just the multimodality gardening. I've always had ADHD even in my garden. <laughs> So I let it run wild there. Um, and so that's what makes me so useful to the gardening community, um, medical and non-medical alike, is that I have experience across the board uh, with gardening methods. And so I can really tailor the knowledge for every client. That's and wonderful. So, right. And uh, I also do consultations uh, as well. And I'm very effective um, just because of my broad base of knowledge from people that want to do soil, hydro. You want to make sure you're using the right organic sprays if you have bug issues. And all this advice comes with our services. So, um, so now, if a person says, I live in a, in a condominium, in a, right. an apartment, how do I grow 10 plants I indoors? I have so much experience with condo gardening because I lived in a condo for so <laughs> long and grew. And um, I've had my medical card even with being as young as I am for quite some time because I have a torn ACL meniscus in my knee, which has been throwing off my back and my skeletal system, giving me pain since I was about 17 years old. Really? Yeah. Um, back when I hurt my knee, they used to, I was like back in the day, 20 years ago, when I hurt my knee, they used to slice you open real bad. So I was always, at, uh, I was always opposed to getting knee surgery where you'd have the big scar. And so, you know, medical things, have, they've come, they've progressed since then. So, but irregardless, I use it for pain management and I've done extensive condo gardening. And so, um, some of the best ways to do condo gardening um, is to make it make your maintenance easy is the best advice. So having a tent, a grow tent, so that you're not spilling anything on your floors, you're not putting any holes in your walls, it's very cost effective uh, to, to get a grow tent. And what that is, is it's a little tent you can construct that would be a parameter of two feet or four feet or four feet by four feet or however big or small you want to kind of make it. And we would start with that, you know, generally for a condo. So someone that wants to do 10 plants is going to be in relation to how big their condo is. Your condo might not be big enough for you to do 10 plants, realistically, at least not maybe in flowering. Yeah. And so what we would do is we would take a look at your space and your budget mm -hmm. and guide you from there. So if your budget is, say, and you have to have a realistic budget for indoor gardening because we are creating an budget? environment and supplementing the sum. What is a sun. realistic budget? I mean, a realistic budget is probably going to sit you at like or seven hundred dollars uh -huh. to be to do something to get small, you started like you know a small inexpensive led is going to be maybe three hundred dollars a tent's going to be maybe the 200 led is the lighting system right and yep. then your little odds and ends to make up a couple hundred dollars nutrients soil fans you know what i mean so about seven hundred dollars would be realistic maybe even eight if depending on the equipment you get you know if you want to do hydro versus soil um and so there's a setup cost but mm -hmm. it is an investment that's not going to depreciate in value for you because your garden's going to keep growing, growing you, growing. your medicine, yes. you know what I mean? You might change out your bulb, which is uh, most light bulbs go out. You get a new light bulb, it only lasts for so long. You're going to buy new nutrients once you run out. And so the upkeep cost of a garden is very minimal, mm -hmm. yeah? Especially when you get into hydroponics, uh, where we use uh, a lot less water, a lot less nutrients, and our plants grow a lot faster. With bigger. hydroponics? Yes, and soil. Conventional soil is great for a lot of crops and things. I also do a lot of vegetable gardening as well. I started growing vegetables when I was a kid and graduated up to the cannabis. <laughs> um, <laughs> Why not? Wink. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> um, and so um, you definitely, uh, oh, I kind of lost my train of thought there for a second. <laughs> but we're, we're growing in, tell me now, with hydroponics, aquaponics, which which would you, or, let, well, what is hydroponics? 
So hydroponics is growing without the use of soil using alter alternative growing mediums. Um, and so what that looks like is instead of soil, I have a medium that's very dry. Think of a uh, cinder, right? It's porous on the inside. Then we take it a step further with that and we have this stuff called hydroton, which is a clay medium that is also renewable because it's clay. It's not mm -hmm. like our cinder cones, we gotta keep digging them, right? It's porous on the inside, just like cinder, but smooth on the outside, so it's easy to reuse for planting. It's a reusable medium. And you can water this once an hour without overwatering your plants. Once an hour. Now, if there's one thing I can clarify on the show, it's let me talk about how to properly water really fast yes. and what overwatering really yeah, don't, is. Don't cover up your microphone. There oh. you go. Hello. <laughs> Um, so overwatering is not watering your plants with too much water at one time. Overwatering is not allowing the oxygen to be present. So overwatering is actually suffocation of the root system by lack of oxygen. Yeah. So if we were to have a plant, like let's just say five gallon pot, regular five gallon pot. Mm -hmm. And I were to dump two gallons through that pot and I have another pot I can put 10 gallons through that pot. As long as I let them dry out, the 10 gallon, the one that has 10 gallons go th going through it will not be overwatered as long as I let it dry out where the oxygen uh -huh. comes back in. And then I water again once the soil gets dry enough and it creates this breathing effect. Uh-huh. Yeah, we water, this, we water the soil, the, the old oxygen goes out as well and dries up and new stuff comes in. And so you have a very healthy environment for your root system and the bacteria that should be there. So if you're watering your plants, if you were to give it two gallons of water, two gallons of water, two gallons of water all the time, you would actually overwater it by giving it 10 gallons all, every day, all, every, every day, day, two gallons, two gallons for five days straight, and you continue to do that, you will overwater your plants. Okay. Yeah. So now what is aquaponics? So aquaponics is the cultivation of plants through use of um, aquaculture, which is um, producing fish. And so it's, it's uh, I find it to be more still in its infancy in ways um, that people are doing it. It's really grown leaps and bounds in the last like five, six years um, with people getting interested in it. Um, and it's more just in the areas of pe people giving the fish proprietary blends of food so that the excrement coming out is more satisfactory to the plants. Because generally fish waste is just ammonium nitrate that gets broken down and it's high in nitrogen after it goes through the bacteria process of breaking it down and it's released as nitrogen and things like that for the plants to eat. But plants require more than just nitrogen. There's phosphorus, potassium, and your secondary macro, which are your main elements, calcium, magnesium, sulfur, and micronutrients as well. Iron's the first one that aquaponic people will come into my store to get liquid iron supplements for their aquaponic system. I do not recommend cannabis growing with aquaponics. I have not seen anyone, I've seen plenty of people start them great, I have not seen too many people, actually I haven't seen any people yet, um, as far as I know on a first-hand basis. Uh, there might be some experts out there that can do this, of course, absolutely. But on a, on a regular consumer basis, I wouldn't recommend aquaponics because it's just not going to flower right. Yeah. For food production, lettuce production, kale, things like that, absolutely. Oh, okay. Yeah. I saw a picture on your web page of the mm -hmm. little fish and the plants on yeah, the top. Yeah, totally. Any and kind of fish? No. <laughs> Um, you, tilapia are better. You can even throw some crawfish in there and just make the water mucky. Um, biggest thing with aquaponics, or one of the biggest things you want to remember, is you need to have a way to catch the waste in an environment that is conducive of the bacteria growing so that they can break the waste down and make it edible for the plants. Because fish waste in its raw form is toxic when it builds up for both them and the plants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the fish and the plants. It's toxic for them unless it breaks down. It's like if you had a fish tank with no filter on it. So with aquaponics, what you need to have is a way, we call it biofilter. You have to have a way of collecting it, having it catch. A lot of people use their growing, uh, their grow bed for aquaponics as their biofilter mm -hmm. uh, to catch the waste, break it down, and as the plants eat it. I like external biofilters better. It's a lot more effective. Um, an efficient way to do aquaponics is having an external filter, the same as you would have for any pond or fish tank, external filter. Right catching the waste, pumping the water back in. And so, and so having an external filter will allow you to use less water in your grow bed. And also you need to clean something out, you're not washing all your bacteria after a while. And so um, that's my recommendation for that. Okay, so, so which you're recommending the hydroponics for beginners? Soil. For beginners, soil. Would actually be better, or if they want to dabble in hydroponics, I recommend cocoa growing mediums. So cocoa core is a coconut growing medium 
Um, it's kind of like between soil and hydroponics where it's planted up in pots, not quite as big as soil would go for space for roots because you don't really need it. It will, the, the specific pots we generally use for a lot of cocoa to keep the pots smaller are fabric and they're called air pruning pots, which allow the roots to grow out, air prune and not get root bound and keep growing. Oh. It's amazing. And so, so you can plant up a bunch of cocoa pots with coconut fiber and your, your medical cannabis plants and you can automate the watering on this because coconut is a very dry medium. Right. Now we can't water it like a cinder medium or a clay medium because mm -hmm. the mediums are all going to have a different water to air ratio. And this is something to be aware of when gardening is know your medium. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Know what you're working well, with in any situation. Anyway, yeah. So know what you're working with. Know its, know its you know, uh, parameters. So with cocoa, you're going to water maybe when they're young, once a day, you know what I mean? Twice a day, you have to keep low nutrient levels, make sure you get a good flow going. If you water not enough and it sits and kind of dries out, you're going to have solidification of nutrients that can build up in your pot. All this is why I'm here. <laughs> all this is what I'm for. It's all yep. this information you get when you come to us for consultations and, and things uh, like that. So now, of course, here in Hawaii, mm -hmm that afternoon sun burns up everything. Midday wilt. It's called yes. midday wilt. So, everything gets it. Yes, everything, including me. Would my you like office. Some solutions for that? My, my office. I have some, <laughs> I have some recommendations for that as well for midday wilt. <laughs> my, the so, afternoon sun comes in like, oh. Anyway, so, so in, in deciding that we're back to uh, in work, I mean, a small Condo place gardening. in your condo or on your lanai or whatever. So yeah. So do we, do you decide or should the person decide where it should be in morning sun, afternoon sun? So um, cannabis specifically needs, um, or more, most, all plants are going to need a minimum amount of light to complete a veg cycle. Right. So a plant's going to have a seedling stage, a veg stage, and a flowering stage. Anything that flowers is going to have those three stages. Anything that doesn't flower is going to have the two stages. Seedling, veg, lettuce, leafy greens, herbs, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So seedling, vegetative stage, pre-flower. Mm -hmm. I think seedling to veg is like from baby to adolescent, uh -huh. and then maturation, adult. Yeah. So um, you're going to need about five hours of direct sunlight minimum um, with a full day's light of 16 hours. So what that means is there's intensity period versus photo period. Photo period is the amount of light hours a plant will register, whether it's intense or not. Um, if it's more than a full moon's light, the plant will register it as daytime. Street lights, you know, light pollution from the house. So light pollution, things like that can be bright enough to affect your plants and keep them from flowering. Oh. Yeah. Oh. I had this problem in my condo in Waikiki mm -hmm. where I had my plants on my lanai. This is why I had to go indoor. Um, it's, it was great to veg on my lanai. I could veg beautifully. It was gorgeous. Gorgeous, because I had southeast facing, you right. know. But when it came time to flower, it was so bright in Waikiki that my plants from the top were just in this perpetuation of veg, and the bottom kind of would bud out, but not really. You know what I mean? And it just the light pollution really screwed up my whole, my whole growth. So, so in planning, your planting back to photo period and how yes. much sun they need. So you've got so the plan. five hours is for veg with a 16-hour day cycle. That 16-hour day cycle lets them know that it's summer and they're not going to flower. In Hawaii, this is why people actually will get little lights to come on on their garden, even mm -hmm. the outdoor guys when it's winter. If you have lights come on in your garden, you can do a veg if you want for like you know what I mean for late winter and catching that last little season going on. Um, in the mainland, they do the opposite. It's called light deprivation. Uh -huh. Here we have light assist. Right. There they have light deprivation. <laughs> so, so on the lanai, as long as your plant's only getting at least eight hours direct sun for flowering, five hours direct sun for veg, this is the amount of intense light it needs to make, the amount of energy it needs to do what it's got to do, and then the rest is just minimal light. So on a 16-hour day, you can have 11 hours of minimal light and five hours direct sun. That's the minimum. On a flowering, you can have a 12-hour light cycle with an eight-hour direct sun minimum. Maybe seven because it's really intense here. And that's the cycles that you need to have happening, regardless of like where do I put it, where do I place it, as long as they get that much direct sun with a photo period conducive of what you want to do. Do you want to veg them out and flower inside? Is it winter? Can you keep vegging them outside and just, you know, have a couple lights come on and then move them indoor to flower? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I end up doing is having a couple lights come on in my garden at 5 o'clock at night till 9.30. 
so I can give them a 16-hour photo period to let them know that they can still veg. Uh -huh. And they're getting the sun for the intensity to look gorgeous. But I'm increasing the photo period so I can veg them, and then I move them to the tent inside. And so, and that's how I kind of balance that out between doing some on my lanai and absorbing some of the cost of the, how much light costs here in Hawaii. It's 36 to 38 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity. And then I can flower inside, so I don't have to have both going with lights and indoor. I can do some on lanai and some inside. So then, again, we're back to, okay, now, where do you get the buds, the plants to begin with? So um, that's, oh, procurement is, you know, a little bit of a gray area, um, just more because of the federal laws, I believe, where people are selling seeds as, what's the word you use? Um, I don't know, at the, at the Cannabis Expo, there were a lot of people with seeds, but right. you would buy the t-shirt and they'd give you the seeds. Right, and that's the, that's a bit of a, you know, gray, oh sorry, that's a bit of a gray area. And that's also a bit of a loophole and to be able to work the legalities of what stipulations you're able to work in. In the same way they've worded the terminology from medical to medical patient, you can do donations. Oh. You know what I mean? And so you donate it. You don't, there's nothing else going on there. And so um, being able to, novelty. They sell the seeds as novelty. Right. And, you know, you buy a necklace with six seeds in it and you pay $60 for a necklace. Yeah. Uh, and so you're not technically, you're just giving the seeds away with it. Mm -hmm. And so they're not selling it. And so that's the only way that they're able to work around it, whether you go to the UK. So I usually, what I've done in the past is um, ordering seeds and stuff like that. Um, and they sell you a novelty, you know, because Hawaii didn't have seed breeders way back in the day, but there were seed banks. And you can go online, you can order seeds, and they send you a shirt with three seeds. Yeah. Well, now. So that's it's the same thing that happens, but I know um, a, a, I I saw so many. Yeah. Even somebody from Norway was at the cannabis. Expo. Yeah, I can't remember. I know that there was. Um, I know Adam there and Bong Bong with Pakalolo seeds, um, Molokai guys. Yeah. So the Molokai seed guys are amazing. Um, and then uh, I think Sirius seeds might have been. I can't remember the guy's name, I'm blanking on it. But there's a couple of really nice local guys that are working with companies and trying to bring um, the genetics to the population. Um, I myself recommend people to go along the lines of like, there's like Pineapple Chunk and Pineapple Express, and as much as people think the pineapple strains have been played out, they're such an easy grow, and they're so okay with having humid and warm weather that those are strains I recommend for beginners. Ah. You know, those are beginner strains. Because they're just a pleasure to grow. They're just easy. Easy. <laughs> yeah, well that, you know? Yeah, when you look at my yard, you think, oh, right. she knows nothing about so, this. It, things it, to be aware of um, now with... The red light went on. Things to be aware of um, when you're doing condo gardening is one, your space, two, your budget, and then just kind of, I really consider myself a garden stylist. So, and I use the word vibe on this, but see what you vibe with. Do you want to go with soil? Do you want to do hydro? Because... Just because your friend does a method doesn't mean you might like it. So sometimes I run into issues where they're like, my friend is it this way. It's like, but what do you really like? So, you know, pick out what you think you're going to like and what you really are interested in because you're going to push harder for that mm -hmm. if you really are interested in it. Um, and, and just come to us for some advice on how to easily change reservoirs and water. And all it really is is consistent feeding, knowing your atmosphere. So when you have a growth space, you want airflow, ventilation, um, and basically just creating your environment, you know, a quality light that's going to have enough intensity. Okay, now, speaking of vibes, mm -hmm. do you talk to the plant? Do you love the plant? Absolutely. You, yes. Okay. I give them my ha. Oh, sorry. Mike. Mike. Um, I give them my breath, my ha. Uh -huh. I breathe my CO2 onto my plants, and I, like, put my face in them. Anytime I make a wound on my plant, I use my own spit, actually, to cover that wound, and I don't know why I do that. That's just That's something you, that just of kind of yep. came along. Yep. And I have a very personal relationship with my garden. Um, and I had this one plant that was a, a mother of mine that I had for a while, and she was amazing. And I used to put my crystal in front of her and sit and meditate with my plant. And, and I'll never forget, all of a sudden in the middle of the stalk, all of a sudden you saw two eyes, a little nose from a stem, and a smiley face. <laughs> and she had a face, and I was like, oh, my God, of course, yes, of course. <laughs> so I just, 
and I get pretty hippie with that. So yes. no, yeah. it's wonderful. It's wonderful. But um, I have a very personal relationship with with gardening. I come from a long line of gardeners. I would think. Uh, because I, I do too, and I don't have any cannabis. I just have a, oh, a myriad of different plants. Awesome. And. Uh, What's your favorite vegetable to grow? Any of them. Oh, really? The orchids moved in with the collard greens. That would be gorgeous. They just, just wrapped around each other. Yeah. So the pots were next to each other, and they just moved in. Yeah. Orchids are uh, parasitic plants. They don't usually exist by themselves, or you always see them attached so on a tree stump. Yes, but they're actually yeah, they're a parasitic so it, plant. And it just moved in with the with the collard greens. Yeah. And then when I moved it, everybody was upset. The the orchid kind of so I had to put it back. Yeah. Yeah. It will kind of reach out to get its nutrients. Yes. From other places, and then there's companion planting, other you know root systems and different microbes uh, being there because of them, and so. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Now, I didn't think orchids and collard greens were going to go. That's pretty cool. Well, I didn't either until I... Right. I'll show you a picture. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, um, I am so delighted to meet you and so happy to have you here. Thanks. You will it's come back pleasure. and spend some more time with us. Oh, I would love to. Okay. Yeah, I'll have to keep you guys posted on any future workshops. Um, I have done a uh, medical cannabis workshop. We started kicking them off with the uh, Malia Clinic. Yes. Uh, and so that was uh, she's been, very fun, been very a guest. Yes. yes, May, I love yes. her so much. She's, but she's in class now on Wednesdays. Mm-mm-mm. Yeah. So, but I was delighted that she was here. But again, thank you so much for You're coming. So this welcome. has been a real pleasure, and we look Absolutely. forward to seeing you again. I look so forward to seeing you again. Aloha, okay. guys. Aloha. <laughs>